Hi, I'm Marty Nemko. Starting yesterday, I decided to uh, read aloud a few uh, essays that have been recently published <clears throat> that have not appeared in the mainstream media, maybe some would say censored by the mainstream media, that I think are worthy of our attention. This one is by Heather MacDonald, author of the book When Race Trumps Merit, and she is the Thomas Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Here the publisher put a little, uh, uh, it's in City Journal, the publisher put a little summary. <clears throat> Pro-Hamas protests have exposed anti-Western ideology as the prevailing belief system on college campuses. The question, whether disgruntled donors and alumni can overcome decades of intellectual misdirection. Universities are waging a war on the West. I have edited this a bit for concision. It's about two-thirds of the length uh, that uh, it was originally published. It'll be about 15 minutes, but I think worthy of your time. <clears throat> University of Pennsylvania President Liz McGill would not have been forced to resign had Penn's donors and alumni not been organizing against her for two months. The Penn rebels have now upped the ante. They've drafted a new, quote, constitution for the school that makes merit the sole criterion for student admissions and faculty hiring. The new charter requires the university to embrace institutional neutrality with regard to <clears throat> politics and faculty research. The rebels want candidates for Penn's presidency to embrace the new charter as a precondition for employment. The university selection committees have one mission only, or at least should have, identifying excellence. Hiring non-excellent diversity candidates makes it harder to attract outstanding faculty and students. That assertion is commonsensical to anyone who believes in merit. The new constitution posits that an unambiguous, publicly understood commitment to excellence will give Penn and a competitive edge in hiring and student admissions in the decades ahead. This too seems commonsensical. With this latest twist in the battle over university leadership, the academy stands at a crossroads. For decades, Wall Street titans funneled billions of their dollars into their alma maters, even as those universities promoted ideas inimical to civilizational excellence and economic success. When students started celebrating the October 7th Hamas attacks, however, the mega donors took note. They did not recognize their campuses, they said, through the pro Hamas rhetoric, though the pro Hamas rhetoric came straight from the ethnic and post colonial studies courses that had been a staple of university curricula since the 1980s. Some donors, at Penn and elsewhere, initiated funding boycotts and sought board shakeups, hoping to pressure their alma maters to correct the anti-Semitism they deemed responsible for the terror celebrations. The pro-Hamas protests have exposed the anti-Western ideology that is the sole unifying belief system on college campuses. The question now is whether disgruntled donors and alumni can overcome decades of intellectual misdirection. To do so, they must first define the problem correctly and avoid the temptation to adopt, for their own purposes, the intersectional left's rhetoric about, quote, safety and, quote, protection from speech. The proposed new Penn Charter is a promising start. The donor revolt could have broken out in any number of campuses, all of which featured ignorant students cheering on the deliberate massacre of civilians those students' faculty enablers and bureaucratic fellow travelers and feckless presidents. But it first erupted at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard, perhaps because of the organization and self-confidence of their alumni. Penn's most generous donors were already on edge at the time of the October 7th massacre. <clears throat> Two weeks earlier, the university had hosted a conference on Palestinian culture called the Palestinian Rights Liter Literature Festival. 
The conference speakers were predominantly anti-Zionist. Some had long been accused of anti-Semitism. Prominent Jewish alumni, such as Ronald Lauder, demanded that Penn President McGill preemptively cancel the conference. Mark Rowan, chairman of the Wharton School's Board of Advisor and a $50 million donor to the school, circulated an open letter asking McGill to denounce the conference's invitations to, quote, known anti-Semitic speakers, remove the Penn logo from conference materials, etc. By September 21st, more than 2,000 alumni, including several current members of Penn's board, had signed the letter. Conference organizer Susan Abul Hawa, a firebrand Palestinian novelist, criticized, quote, the hysterical racist conversations and panic, end quote, over the festival. Quote, we remain proud, unbroken, defiant, honoring our ancestors even though we are battered, colonized, exi exiled, raw, terrorized, and demeaned wholesale, she announced in typically florid rhetoric. The university tried to split the difference between the festival's critics and advocates. On September 12th, it put out a statement noting, quote, deep concern about several speakers. The conference went forward without incident, despite the occasional anti-Zionist trope, such as might be found on any given day in a pen class on, quote, settler colonialism. Nevertheless, the fuse was ready to be lit. Following the October 7th massacre, McGill made the blunders that would bedevil other college presidents. She did not respond to the attacks with sufficient alacrity to satisfy her critics and failed to use the words I condemn and terrorism when she did respond. By the time she put out a correction on October 15th, it was too late. The donor revolt was already spreading. Rowan, said to be Penn's wealthiest alumnus, initiated a second mass movement, a Close the Checkbook campaign. He urged alumni to send in one dollar to Penn and explained that their ordinary contributions would be suspended until Miguel, McGill and the chair of Penn's board, investment bank CEO Scott Bach, resigned. Despite a flurry of big name and big dollar defections, Penn's Board of Trustees put out various statements in support of McGill and Bach. The hypocrisy had reached gargantuan proportions. Even as Penn's leadership and faculty proclaimed their devotion to free speech, law professor Amy Wax was in the dock for statements criticizing racial preferences and U.S. immigration policy. Since publishing an op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer in 2017, advocating the embrace of bourgeois values as a means of economic and social advancement, Wax has been under relentless attack from the law school's leadership and faculty. The leadership had banned her from teaching first-year law courses. In 2022, Penn initiated a formal investigation to determine whether her, quote, intentional and incessant racist, sexist, xenophobic, and homophobic actions and statements, end quote, were serious enough to require a, quote, major sanction, end quote, that could include stripping her of tenure and firing her. No leader of Penn's faculty senate and no representative from its chapter of the American Association of University Professors objected to the hounding of Wax for protected speech. The board looked the other way. Yet here they all were declaring Penn to be a lighthouse of free expression. In fact, the campus left and its administrative enablers accused their opponents of double standards, since some donors were calling for bans on his anti-Israel speech. After the Penn trustees voted to express their confidence in McGill and Bach on October 16th, trustee Andy Rachleff, co-founder of Benchmark Capital, scoffed, there are a lot of people who want free speech, except when it affects them. McGill did not survive the storm. She offered her resignation on December 9th. Some of Harvey, Harvard's, Harvard's wealthiest donors had also been closing their checkbooks since October 7th due to President Gay's, uh, Claudine Gay, uh, perceived foot dragging when it came to condemning the terror attacks. Billionaire investor Bill Ackman had called for the release of names of student signatories to an early pro Hamas letter so that firms could avoid hiring those students. The Kennedy School lost millions of dollars in donation. Former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney 
and other Harvard Business School graduates responded to the campus militancy on October 23rd in an open letter to Harvard leadership regarding anti-Semitism on campus. The letter attracted more than 2,300 alumni signatures in two weeks. Donor Ackman, who had taken the lead in the campaign against Harvard, had been going through a very public education on the diversity, equity, and inclusion complex. On November 6th, he admitted on CNBC that until recently he had never read Harvard's diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. And when he did, he was surprised to learn that the school's DEI mandate did not cover, quote, all marginalized groups, as he put it, such as Asians and Jews. The solution, in Ackman's view, was to expand the diversity bureaucracy's client base to include the full panoply of students and faculty. This recommendation showed that Ackman, a liberal Democrat, remained naive about the university. The alleged, quote, marginalized groups at Harvard and elsewhere are at zero risk of being harmed by the majority. They are petted and feted at every possible opportunity by an ever-diminishing white subset of the campus population that either embraces its fictional role of oppressor or is dragooned into playing one. A month later, Ackman was, call, was calling for the elimination of DEI, though he rushed to deny that he meant to, quote, suggest whatsoever that the goal of a diverse university that is welcoming for all should be abandoned, end quote. But Harvard is already welcoming to all. Its only goal should be to provide the most rigorous possible intellectual training for its students. President Claudine Gay at Harvard had a supreme advantage that McGill lacked, the magic amulet of race. McGill could check off just one box in the victim sweepstakes, being female. Gay was not only female, but the, quote, first black president, end quote, of Harvard, as her supporters in the media never tired of reminding us. The Harvard Corporation, that is its board of directors, is itself 27% black, twice the percentage of blacks in the population, and 36% underrepresented minority when its Hispanic member is included. Almost all of Harvard's black professors wrote a letter as, quote, the black members of the Harvard University faculty, end quote, urging President Gay's retention. Any suggestion that Gay was elevated, quote, based on considerations of race and gender are specious and politically motivated. The devastating legacies of slavery and white supremacy, I might mention, by the way, that she got tenure at uh, Stanford before having written only four articles. She's only written a total of 11 and no books, all of which are on the DEI issue, uh, whereas almost, there are hundreds of thousands of professors, would-be professors at a Harvard or a Stanford who wouldn't have a prayer if they were white or Asian, something that was documented by Victor Davis Hanson in a recent, uh, in a recent, recent uh, essay he wrote. The pro-Hamas uprising that broke out across American universities after October 7th roused once somnolent alumni and donors. That awakening has now produced that charter that I mentioned, that she mentioned, I'm just reading, Vision for a New Future for the University of Pennsylvania. I'm skipping to the redundant parts here because this was written in two parts and she's being redundant here to, you know, to catch people up if they didn't read the first part. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Pen 2.0, that's this proposed charter, overcomes in one stroke a weakness bedeviling a central strategy of campus reform. Those seeking to create new universities face a challenge that no new institution can offer, the prize that a legacy university confers, status and bragging rights. It is prestige that drives the ever more frenzied torrent of college applications rather than any promise of knowledge. The beauty of the Penn 2.0 plan is that it refounds Penn on a new footing while maintaining Penn's prestige granting power. Were Penn 2.0 to become part of the presidential hiring search, it would be clarifying to see how many university apparatchiks demurred from its principles. Penn's temporary replacement for ousted President McGill shows how heavy a lift Penn 2.0 is going to be. Penn's trustees chose J. Larry Jameson, now dean of Penn's medical school, to serve as the university's interim president. As soon as Jameson took over the medical school in 2011, 
He placed diversity hiring and indoctrination at the core of his administration. He created the school's first vice dean for inclusion and diversity and first associated dean, associate dean for diversity and inclusion. Naturally, an office of inclusion and diversity followed, which rolled out endless diversity initiatives and mandates, including health equity weeks, the transgender patient advocate program, and the LGBT student trainee faculty mentorship program. In 2021, Jameson initiated what the Penn Press Office called a, quote, new institution-wide program aimed at eliminating structural racism, end quote, hint. There is no structural racism at the Penn Medical School. The medical school, like the rest of the university, is desperate to admit and hire as many blacks and Hispanics as possible, often disregarding academic skill gaps to do so. As with all such duplicative programs, the conceit of the 2021, quote, initiation institution-wide anti-racism initiative was that the school was for the first time prioritizing diversity, quote, at all levels of staffing. Jameson, in other words, would scorn the proposed new constitution if asked to stay in the presidential post permanently. And the trustees who put him in the interim position presumably support his diversity crusade since it has been impossible to miss during his med school tenure. Do the rebel donors have the financial clout to force the charter on the university anyway? It remains to be seen how much financial pain the alumni dissenters can inflict and what its effect will be. For every alumnus who now perceives his university's intellectual betrayals, many others undoubtedly back the aims of the intersectional university. This ratio will only grow with every new generation of graduates. Any university reform movement is running a race against time. It is not hard to imagine a counter-fundraising push from those alumni who agree with the anti-racism agenda. While the financial battle takes shape, however, the donor rebellion needs to sharpen its positions to ensure its greatest chance of success. However odious the student chants of intifada, intifada, and glory to our martyrs, however shocking professorial tweets calling Hamas's attacks exhilarating and extraordinary, such speech should be punished only if it directly incites violence, or if the speaker physically harasses or threatens someone. Banning such utterances will not erase the beliefs behind them, it is better to have those beliefs out in the open, where they can be challenged and their sources identified. Second, the donors must avoid the rhetoric of safetyism, calling for the protection of, quote, unsafe Jewish students, when that unsafety is primarily a psychological state, will only strengthen the therapeutic academy to the long-term detriment of free thought. Jewish students understandably feel under siege when their classmates cheer on Hamas, but such expression is protected under free speech principles. While physical attack or incitement to imminent violence must be criminally prosecuted and its perpetrators expelled, there have been thankfully few such incidents. Indeed, a Harvard student organizing Jewish alumni against the school admitted to me that he feels under no physical threat walking on campus. A Jewish Princeton student said the same. As of December 14, 2023, no violence or physical conflict confrontations had taken place at Yale involving Jewish students. Yes, some Jewish students are in fear for their lives on their campuses, but civil order will need to break down much further for that to be a realistic assessment. Donors and alumni should remember that it was in the name of fighting, quote, hate and protecting student, quote, safety, that the campus diversity bureaucracy reached its present proportions and power. Absent a transformation in campus personnel, bolstering the authority to quell alleged hate and safeguard intellectual and psychological, quote, safety, will be used overwhelmingly against views and speakers deemed conservative. The biggest course correction is to broaden the diagnosis of the university's current pathology. By psychologizing the pathology as one of anti-Semitism, and by demanding that the university fight this psychological problem, the alumni are walking into a trap. Asking college bureaucrats to protect Jewish students from anti-Semitism is like threatening to throw Br'er Rabbit into the briar patch. The bureaucrats are only too happy to comply. They have been busily adding new modules on anti-Semitism to existing diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, all in the name of fighting hate. Of course, they immediately add that they must also fight Islamophobia, so the diversocrats get a twofer increase in their administrative remit. 
Rebellious donors may be placated by seeing their campus's sudden commitment to anti-Semitism task forces and diversity trainings and conclude that the crisis is on the way to being solved. But the problem is much deeper than anti-Semitism, and the college administrators are outfoxing the rebel alumni by adopting the rebel's definition of the issue. The problem is an entire anti-Western ethos that now dominates most of the humanities and social sciences, and that in STEM is corroding excellent and meritocracy. Jews are today seen as the embodiment of that reviled Western civilization, rather than, as in the past, a threat to it. What is today labeled anti-Semitism on college campuses has no connection to the genteel anti-Semitism of the early 20th century, and yet college presidents are insisting on just such a linear. As Harvard president Claude Dean Gay on October, 20, October 27th asserted. The majority of today's anti-Semitism comes from a different source than the one Gay alluded to. That source is the intersectional left, composed of self-proclaimed marginalized groups pretending to be oppressed by phantom white supremacy. The intersectional left hates the West, and it hates Jews because they represent the West. If the essence of the West is what is called in ethnic and post-colonial studies departments, quote, secular colonialism, which effaces virtuous, ecologically sensitive native people of color, then Israel exemplifies a settler colonialist genocidal state. The closest thing on campuses today to traditional anti-Semitism comes from Muslim students and faculty, many of whom have imbibed classic anti-Jewish rhetoric from birth. They are joined by, quote, allies, innocent of such propaganda, but well-versed in every left-wing indictment against their own civilization. Those Muslim carriers of the traditional anti-Semitism virus are out of sight in the current discussion of campus anti-Semitism, lest anyone face charges of Islamophobia or a Trumpian lack of appreciation for immigrants. Officially invisible, too, are black anti-Semites, whose century-long strain of anti-Semitism has been unbroken. By asserting a genealogy linking historic mainstream anti-Semitism to contemporary academic anti-Semitism, President Gay subtly reinforces the unspoken assumption that conservative whites pose the main threat to American Jews. Traditionally, an article of faith among mainstream Jewish advocacy groups, such as the Anti-Defamation League, and among liberal Jews themselves. At the same time, President Gay diverts attention from the actual sources of anti-Jewish agitation, the faculty, the curriculum, and Muslims. The dissident donors need to home in on those sources. To take just one example, in 2015, Yale President Peter Salovey promised to pour even more funding into Yale's ethnicity, race, and migration program. This largesse was part of Salovey's personal crusade against Yale's alleged racism. The ERM program is emblematic of every such, quote, ethnic and, quote, post-colonial studies program across the U.S. According to its course catalog description, it, quote, draws from the long-standing fields of U.S. ethnic and native studies, post-colonial and subaltern studies, but also represents emergent areas like queer of color critique, comparative diaspora studies, critical Muslim and critical refugee studies, race and media studies, feminist science studies, and the environmental humanities, end quote. Adumbrated in that roll call are the student coalitions, quote, from the Rockies to the Smokies, to adopt the phrase that celebrated the Hamas attacks. Like every ethnic studies program, Yale's ERM concentration unabashedly declares its political nature. Quote, we actively support public-facing and socially engaged scholarship and cultural work, end quote, an activist mission that the pro-Hamas demonstrators saw themselves as furthering. As a lecturer at Harvard's Graduate School of Education told the Harvard Crimson earlier this year, quote, if it is not focused on the project of decolonization, if it is not rooted directly in communities, if it is not intersectional, then it's not ethnic studies. And if it is focused on the project of decolonization as an active community participant, it belongs nowhere within a university. Yale professor Zarina Grewal, a documentary filmmaker who teaches in the ERM program, is an embodiment of the ethnic and post-colonial studies establishment. Grewal's second film for television, Swahili Fighting Words, quote, 
traces the legacies of slavery, colonialism, and diasporic identity politics, end quote, through Tanzanian rap music. Predictably, she defended the October 7th attacks, since, as she put it, quote, settlers are not civilians. This is not hard, end quote. She added, quote, my heart is in my throat. Prayers for Palestinians. Israel is a murderous, genocidal, settler state, and Palestinians have every right to resist through armed struggle, solidarity, hashtag free Palestine, end quote. Such rhetoric is everywhere. Penn English professor Ania Lumba is another quintessence of the pro-Hamas campus left. Lumba teaches histories of race and colonialism, post-colonial studies, and feminist theory. Her 2021 English class, quote, Can the Subaltern Speak? Identity, Politics, and Life Writing, assigned such pro-revolutionary writers as Antonio Gramsci, Franz Fanon, and Paulo Freire. Other readings attacked mass, quote, incarceration and, quote, race and class in the age of Trump, because, you know, this was an English class. Lumba chairs doctoral dissertations on such topics as The Nation and Its Deviance, Global Psychology and the Racial Grammar of Sex in Colonial India, 1870-1950, to 1950, thus ensuring an unbroken line of identity-based, victim-celebrating academics and a steady stream of students proclaiming their own victimhood or as a second-best alternative, solidarity with local non-white victims. For now, the campus left is sitting on its hands and staying silent as its core beliefs are reviled by campus administrators and by the Democratic Party establishment. But it is hard to imagine such self-discipline lasting, and when that self-control finally breaks down, the results will be enthralling to watch. Universities are waging a war on the West. Israel is just its current manifestation. Any optimism about the current moment must be tempered. There have been other efforts, most notably by journalist and activist David Horowitz, to make universities honor their obligation to pass on a civilizational inheritance with love and gratitude. They all failed. But this time feels different. The sheer scope of attention that has been focused on the university, the array of powerful individuals who are mobilized, the daily revelations about conflicts of interest and shameless double standards provide momentum that, if maintained, could result in actual change. To be sure, the beneficiaries and perpetrators of the intersectional status quo outnumber the rebels. They make up the vast majority of the administration, the majority of professors, and vast majority of graduate students in non-STEM fields, and a growing number of faculty administrators and administrators even in STEM. Trustees are either deliberately oblivious to this reality or agents of it. Nevertheless, as one rebel donor told me, all it takes on corporate boards sometimes is one or two determined trustees to turn around a company. With the Penn 2.0 charter as a template, and with enough persistence on the part of the rebels, the next generation of college students may have real opportunities beyond today's handful of contrarian colleges to immerse themselves in beauty, sublimity, sublimity, and the wonder of knowledge. Anyway, that essay is called The, Academ the Academy at the Crossroads by Heather MacDonald, the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and author of When Race Trumps Merit. You uh, certainly can see the whole uh, article by simply Google The Academy at the Crossroads and the name Heather MacDonald, M-A-C. Donald, MacDonald. In any event, I uh, thank you if you stayed with me this long. Uh, it's impressive in itself, uh, let alone if you're open to the possibility of uh, uh, considering this very different perspective than what you will get in the mainstream media. Uh, I think it's worthy of your attention. In any event, I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. And certainly would welcome you checking out any of my 30 books. They're all on Amazon. Perhaps most relevant to this uh, essay is my book, Thought Experiments, of which one, uh, one of the thought experiments is A World Without Israel. But most have nothing to do with this topic. They're all manner of things. In any event, just go to Amazon uh, and search on my name, Marty Nemko, N-E-M-K-O, and you will find more than you can stomach. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemko.